Welcome everyone to um, the uh, webinar series on uh, licensing and research data. This is our, the fourth in our series. Uh, my name is Adrian Burton. I'm a Director of Services at ANS. Um, today we have with us, uh, as usual, Baden Appleyard, the uh, Pro National Program Director of Osgol. How are you, Baden? Hi, oh, Adrian. Good day, Adrian. How are you doing? Yeah, um, and uh, we'll be hearing from Baden a little bit later uh, as part of the, this discussion, and then we'll get our regular update on Osgol as well. Uh, today we have a special guest, Dr. Matthew Todd. Are you with us, uh, Matthew? Hello, yes. Hi, Matthew. Matthew's from the uh, University of Sydney, uh, an organic chemist, is that right? Or is there a, or a, a chemist in general? That's for organic chemist, yes. Organic which means, chemist. What, which means mean? not what you think. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, it, that's not like organic foods and things like that, is that that's right? That's right. No, no, not. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, you're with the School of Chemistry, that's right, at uh, University of Sydney. But I see here we've uh, done our extensive research on Google on you. But uh, you've also been at the University of London as well as Cambridge and Berkeley, is that right? That's right, yes. Sounds like a, um, an interesting career and uh, publications seem to be just, you know, filling pages here, so I won't even uh, go into those. Um, I see that you're part of the uh, Open Wetware um, uh, organisation, which sounds very interesting. And I, is that something you might be talking about a little bit later as well? Definitely, we'll be covering that. Yes, mm, it sounds uh, fascinating. You know, I know I know about open, open software, and um, fascinated to hear about open wetware. The thing which took my attention was this statement where you were saying we're trying to make the right molecule in the right place at the right time. Which yeah, sounds like a very indeed. modern approach to things. You know, that's what we're trying to do with information to get the the right information <laughs> at the right place in the right time. Like um, so, yeah. And I'm assuming that uh, some of those problems with information will lead on here. So the reason we've got um, Matthew here is to talk about his research you know, uh, in general uh, and his approach. So that's you know, something about the organic chemistry that's behind all of this. Uh, but also in particular, we're interested in his uh, approach to research and this uh, whole idea of open science and how that's um, changing the way we do research. And in particular, because it's part of our licensing webinar, how the, the free flow of information and the access to information and the clarity around reuse arrangements, uh, you know, as uh, exemplified in licenses and things like that, you know, how that is uh, affecting you know, positively or negatively um, the world of research. Um, so you have a uh, presentation for us, is that right, uh, Matthew? So I'll I do, yes. see whether uh, by the miracles of modern science, modern information science, we can switch over to your desktop. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you. Um, thank you for that intro, and thank you for the for the chance to come and talk to you about some of the stuff that we're doing. Um, which is based in, in a scientific research project. Um, and I'll talk about two different projects which are united in the way in which they try and handle information and in the way in which they try and do science in a slightly different way. Um, uh, one started uh, many years ago, um, but as I'll describe, it sort of gathered pace more recently. And another project is about a, about a year old. Um, so uh, the, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the background to why we wanted to do these projects, um, which is an important bit of context. And then um, there'll be a little bit of chemistry, but not much, just, just uh, enough so that you understand what it is we're trying to do. And then um, I will spend some time, uh, I guess, throughout, but more in the second half throughout, uh, talking about how it is we're doing some of these projects. So the sort of technical um, things that we've adopted to try and make this research um, happen. Um, so the the main uh, question we uh, that I had many years ago, um, but back in about 2005, 2006, um, was uh, I, I was fascinated by by the differences in how we do things in in science um, versus what was happening in software. Um, 
So uh, I, I was a I was a postdoc back in about 2000, 99, 2000, when the web really was starting to take off, I guess, and things, amazing things were, were were happening. And then um, I, I was an academic for a few years, um, and then I left the UK and came here. And at the time, I was I had a scientific problem, which I'll get to in a minute, um, which made me think about the way in which we do uh, science and do research more generally. And I, I you read around a little bit, and I came across this analogy from software of the cathedral and the bazaar. Um, as, a, as, a, as a model of describing how it is we do work, how we, how we try and achieve things. Um, so with the top model being this cathedral model where, where we, we tend to work in a closed team and build beautiful things and we're all very highly trained and everything's very expensive, but we achieve a, a, amazing outcomes. Um, versus the bizarre model, which is maybe where we don't control participation and we allow anyone to show up and we don't really plan it. Um, and there's a very minimal overhead involved, but something sort of emerges from a kind of collective action with a, with a minimum amount of planning. Um, and both of these things, they're, they're very different things, but both of them can be extremely effective at doing certain things, at achieving certain things. Um, and I found this very interesting um, in, in, from the point of view of software, and it made me think about the way in which we do research. So a lot of things are being highlighted in the last few years. I think a lot of things have been highlighted about limitations in the way that we do research um, uh, for various reasons. Um, uh, you can point to problems in incentivization of research, uh, that, that people are trying to uh, get a lot of papers out very quickly or trying to demonstrate a result and get a patent and generate money. Um, a lot of these kind of motivations are relevant. And, and you think, well, is, is the process of research working um, and is it working as well as it could? So these are two separate questions, I guess. Um, I think most people would think that research is working, um, but uh, one has to be very careful. Um, and there are some pretty shocking cases where research, um, the, the process of research isn't really working very well. And, and this was one of the most shocking from last year, I think. Um, actually, I read this earlier this year, but I think it's published last year, which was a, a study by a couple of uh, scientists at Amgen, so one of the best known biotechnology companies in the States. Um, in which they set out to reproduce the research findings of 53 papers in the area of oncology. So these are preclinical findings. So these are the kind of this is the kind of research that you do in academia or early stage industry, which is preclinical trials for a drug. But it's the work that you build on uh, to make a drug discovery program. Um, and in in trying to reproduce this work, they found that only six of the 53, so 11 percent of the cases, could be reproduced. Um, which is pretty shocking, um, given that uh, you know a very promising study in preclinical oncology could set a, a line of research going for many years and involve the investment of many millions. Um, and there are there are other studies like this where people are questioning the validity, really, uh, or reproducibility of important research findings. Um, and in biomedical research, of course, it's very important that we have things right and that can be reproduced, and we're building on a very solid foundation. Um, but it does make you wonder about reproducibility of science more generally, and, and in general terms, we don't really worry too much about reproducibility, in the sense we don't tend to often reproduce published work, um, partly because such work doesn't result in publications. So there's like very little incentive to, to duplicate or try and reproduce um, uh, known research findings. Okay, so there's, there, there's a potential issue with research in terms of checking for validity and checking, you know, checking how reliable uh, procedures are. And of course, one of the reasons why it's a problem is because all the data associated with a uh, research project, all the data are not necessarily available. Um, a, an academic paper or a patent is rather like a press release in the sense we check, we, we choose the data we'd like to release to the public um, and, 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 uh, and release those data. We don't necessarily release the other 95% of the data, which indicated that the, the proposed, you know, uh, method or research finding wasn't quite as smooth and, and neat as, as it's published, uh, as it's described in the publication. Um, there's a big problem with drug discovery um, as well um, at the moment uh, in the sense that what used to be an extremely profitable, it still is profitable, but extremely profitable and, uh, and, and promising industry, uh, uh, major pharmaceutical industries in the world, um, are undergoing rather a downturn for a number of reasons. Some are economic, some are scientific. Um, but there are significant issues, which means that the drug industry that I knew when I was a PhD student is no longer really there. Um, it's, it's not quite um, as big and, and as profitable as it used to be, and there are significant challenges um, to that industry. Um, a lot of fantastic work is still being done, 
uh, obviously, but there is less um, sort of, uh, I don't know, adventurous R&D perhaps, um, and there are, there are major economic challenges to the industry. So big research sites being closed, um, such as the one in Sandwich in Kent, the, the Pfizer research site that discovered Viagra has closed, um, um, along with, with lots of others. So drug discovery is, is in particular uh, undergoing a real downturn uh, at the moment. So there are, there, there are these issues. So I, I became interested in, in thinking about how we do science um, in the age of the web. And um, on, on the left here, there's a schematic of the sort of typical process that's involved when you do research in science, um, where someone does some work and then publishes that, and then someone else reads it, um, and then responds to it, uh, either by doing some work in the lab or, or applying for a grant or so on, or, or one of these things. And, and those blue arrows are meant to indicate a lot of time delay between uh, those events. So it's a very serial process um, with lots of delays of grant review and paper review uh, and, and so on. Um, and what I was wondering, taking the leaf out of the software development book, was whether we could do science in a different way, where we just use the web, instead of it being an information resource, we actually use it to work together, um, which is not a radical philosophy from, from the point of view of software, but it is from the point of view of science, where we don't tend to, to do this. So I was very inspired by these things I was reading about, um, both in information side, like Wikipedia, but also in software, like Firefox and Linux and all these things. Um, and I was amazed at the speed with which really reliable products were being developed. I mean, the ascent of Wikipedia is just unbelievable, um, how rapidly this thing was put together in many different languages, how many times bigger it is now than Britannica um, and, and other things, and how, how what a great resource it is. It apparently emerged with minimal coordination um, compared to the size of the, the project. So I was very inspired by that and thought, well, can we um, apply some of these principles of, of, a, of a network which is not um, strongly, necessarily strongly coordinated and which relies upon the inputs of many? Can we use that in, in science? Um, now, there are a few things that um, have been done or, or were being done um, that, that are along these lines. So um, we've recently seen science being done on the web using citizen science, where you have a project which requires the, the inputs, the, the reasonably small inputs of a large number of people. Um, so the Galaxy Zoo and Folded projects, these are spectacular projects which have resulted in, in meaningful high impact scientific outcomes. Folded is about protein folding and Galaxy Zoo is about classification of galaxies, which have involved thousands of people. Um, and applications have been written uh, on the web, which allow people to input, so citizens and untrained scientists, in many cases, um, have contributed to these projects, which is which is really tremendous. Um, the Polymath project, which started at the same time, around the same time as um, as the project I'm about to tell you about, was a problem started by the Fields medalist uh, Tim Gowers um, at Cambridge University, and the idea was to solve a problem in pure mathematics using a blog, and whether that could be done. So again, without restricting who could take part. Um, you just open this problem up and say, okay, well, who wants to chip in? Very simple idea, really. But against much of the kind of cathedral model of academia, where someone is meant to be seen to be in charge, and the project structure is meant to be quite restricted um, and, and, and well elucidated, um, an open project on the web is much more chaotic seeming. So there are a bunch of different things here, and I, won't, I haven't got time to talk, talk about all these in, in detail, but there's the ranges from things to citizen science, where you have participants from the public to sort of smaller projects where you're expecting the participants to be more, um, have, have greater expertise in the, in the underlying science, like the Polymath project, and like the thing that I'm going to tell you about uh, now. So the idea, I like this quote that I, I found recently, the idea instead of uh, the usual academic model of us working in secret and competing without knowing what each other is doing, um, instead of that kind of feral competition, you, you embrace this idea of conscious cooperation, which means that you know what everyone else is doing which is the difference. So um, you don't keep secrets. I mean, it's the difference between a 100 meter sprint at the Olympics, where everyone is on a level playing field and you can see how fast everyone's going, versus this idea that you run in a kind of tunnel and you can't see what everyone else is doing, and you just do your best, but you don't, you don't really see what else is going on around you. Uh, and I think um, uh, a sort of open competition, which ironically results in conscious cooperation, um, where everything is shared, was an interesting idea and one we wanted to try and apply. Um, I, I like this this paper I found recently too, which which implies that if you can develop a network of people who interact in a kind of light way with dynamics, links between people, not too strong, not too weak, but the kind that you see, I think, in a lot of software projects, um, that you can in, in, encourage people to cooperate 
Um, I, I kind of I, I like this because this kind of network feels like it exists behind the two projects that we've that we've run uh, that are open science. Um, that people can come and leave depending on the project need and depending on that person's enthusiasm for the project. So it's very dynamic. Um, okay, so there are, there are a number of things about sharing data which are happening in science. So um, there are lots of initiatives in, in, in trying to share data. Um, and the idea, of course, is to get more eyeballs on a problem. So you, you try and uh, unlock data so that anyone can look at the data and can um, develop ways of searching the data and spotting patterns. And these are extremely important, and a few of these are listed here, but this is a lot of drug discovery stuff, and there, of course there are lots of other initiatives around the world for, for promoting open data, which are all very important. Um, but just to, just to be clear, open data, that's very important, but it doesn't necessitate anybody actually working with anybody else. So you can take the data and download the data and then chew it on your own, uh, and then do something in secret. You don't have to you know, release any of that, you don't have to work with anybody. And I guess the thing I was interested in was more specifying a problem or specifying something needs to be done and then actively working with people in an open arena where you don't keep any secrets, um, which is a different thing, which is actually a collaboration which is open rather than just having data. Um, data you have to build on data, but it's not enough for a collaborative project. So the project we started, um, and this was back in 2006, we, I first posted this. Um, was on this disease called schistosomiasis, and you don't need to know about, about this, but it's a neglected tropical disease which is very significant in sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere, um, and it affects 400 million people worldwide, but we don't tend to see it very much in Australia, because it's not in Australia, uh, it's, it's mainly in, um, in the most impoverished nations, and it's a, it's a very nasty parasite, it lives in your blood and lays eggs in your internal organs and, and does serious damage. Um, it frequently doesn't kill you on its own, which is one of the reasons why it's neglected, um, but makes you extremely sick and, and you don't develop correctly and it's a massive uh, economic and social burden on, on various societies. So there's a, there's a terrible disease there and thankfully there's this very good drug which you can use to treat it which has this structure here, it's called prosequantum. It's been known since the 70s, it's off patent um, and it's a very nice compound. So it's given at the moment to about 100 million people and needs to be given to more than that if we're going to try and uh, make serious dent in the, in the infection rate of this disease. Uh, various agencies like the Gates Foundation give this drug to um, to whole populations in, in various countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, now there are, couple, there are a couple of issues with this drug. Um, one is that it's the only one that's available to treat this disease, so we have to use it very carefully so that we don't develop resistance in the parasite, otherwise that would be catastrophic. Um, the other is that um, it tastes really terrible and that might seem like a cosmetic thing, but it's not. If you if you imagine trying to give this drug to millions of people, uh, if it has a really bitter taste, which it does, it's a dreadfully bitter taste, then a lot of people just don't want to take it. Um, and so they either don't take it or they don't take enough of it. And you can actually enhance resistance by doing that, by giving sublethal doses of, of medicine. So for, particularly for kids, this is a problem if they don't take this drug. Um, it turns out that the, the molecule has a certain feature, it has this thing that um, it, it, it exists in two forms, like your hands. So the molecule that's given is the one on the top there, uh, and that's actually two separate molecules shown beneath, and these things are mirror images. Um, so like your hands, they look the same, but they're actually not in mirror images. Uh, and the one on the bottom left there is the one that works and kills the parasite very effectively. Uh, and the one on the right, which is the mirror image of the molecule, which is also in the pill, um, tastes really awful and it's rather bad for you and doesn't kill the parasite. So the World Health Organization uh, we were talking to a few years ago and, and said, look, it would be great if instead of making the one on the top there, which is a really easy thing to make, which has this sort of symmetrical feature, which um, most inexpensive things have, like bowls and mugs, they're symmetric and so they're kind of cheap to make. Um, uh, it would be great if instead of making a symmetric thing, we can make just the, the molecule on the bottom left, the one that is great at killing the parasite but doesn't taste about it. Um, and exclude the one on the bottom right, so get rid of the taste of this thing, um, and then market the drug like that. So um, that would be great because A, it wouldn't taste bad, and B, um, it would be a smaller pill, actually less molecule to take, you know, so your kind of drug burden goes down and the pill is easier to take and so on. And, and now this is actually a very difficult problem um, in chemistry. I mean, a lot of organic chemists I know spend their professional lives trying to solve problems like this. Um, and it's difficult because, of course, as soon as you start doing research on something, you increase the price of it. Um, and the price has come down so much through generics manufacture and competition um, that you can give someone a pill of this drug for about 10 cents. And, and if you start doing research on it, the price is going to go up, and that means you're not going to be able to afford to give it to millions of people. 
So this was interesting from my perspective because it was a chemical problem, uh, an important chemical problem, and one that I didn't see that we could solve in academia because um, in academia we don't normally worry about the price of things. Um, we normally just try and discover new things without worrying about price. And of course, industry didn't want to solve it because there's no profit margin. So we had a problem here which I thought was important to solve and we couldn't solve with traditional research mechanisms. That was the idea. So I was stewing on this and thinking, wouldn't it be great if, because uh, I didn't know how to do this, wouldn't it be great if instead of me working on this in secret and occasionally releasing uh, things that I've done, that I put this out on the web and say, well, who's got a good idea here and who wants to help out experimentally? So that was the idea. And that, that was the problem that we started with. Um, so to do that, we had to get things online. And to do that, we had to start sharing data. Um, like I said, it's important to have open data. Um, and I had experience with this previously in a, in a drug repurposing project that's shown, shown there where a bunch of work was done by a group and all the data were deposited online. This is at the um, Tropical Disease Initiative. Uh, but there was no project that's, that followed up online. So again, it was open data. And uh, this thing on the bottom about Glaxo depositing anti-malarial drug data, I'll come back to in a minute. But again, it's open data being deposited and doesn't actually involve any collaboration that's happening online. So we had to get a collaboration going, a project where people contributed. And the Synaptic Leap website was something that we started up in about 2005, 2006. So I met someone called Ginger Taylor who just started this up and, and my project went up as one of the first projects that was, that was there. And so, you know, we posted this um, scientific problem as a, as a thing that people could help us with um, or could contribute to as a, for, for a solution of how we might prepare this drug um, as this single mirror image form without a price going on. And people um, kind of uh, helped when they knew that the problem was there. But um, as a, there's a suggestion there from a colleague of mine in, in uh, Queensland uh, who suggested something very good, which is actually something we're trying. But um, the problem was, of course, that there's, that there's no real incentive for people to participate because we, we're not really driving the project ourselves. I had no one in the lab who was, who was on this project. And so um, we weren't really seen as being an active kernel of the, of the project. Um, and, and that was an issue. So eventually I realized this and I, I got some funding from the World Health Organization uh, with, as a linkage partner uh, with the ARC. And um, we got this, we were told we got, we got this funded about 2000, mid 2008, and then it took about a year to sign the contract. So we got it started in the lab in about January 2010. Um, and the first thing that we had to do was to make sure that the work that we were doing resulted in data being deposited in the public domain. Uh, and that meant that our lab book, um, which traditionally speaking is a paper thing that sits on your desk, um, had to become electronic. More than that, it had to be a lab notebook that was um, on the web. So we had to use um, an openly available electronic lab notebook to describe what we were doing. Now, a lot of people around the world use electronic lab notebooks. A lot of industry have their own, um, and, and that's good. But I mean, none of them are on the web. So I was one of the, one of the first that was kind of sitting there on the web. So every experiment is there, and all the data are associated with, a, with a, an experiment there. Um, additionally, we wanted to make sure that the platform itself was open source because if we wanted people to work with us, um, it had to, they had to be able to do that with a zero overhead essentially. So we didn't want to require that people who wanted to work on the project um, had to buy software. So in, in this case, this uh, software called LabTrove, which was developed by the University of Southampton in the UK, was perfect. It's a pretty simple blogging type platform which has been adapted. As, a, as an electronic lab notebook and has certain features there which are kind of useful. Um, I'll show you a, a, a page of it uh, in, in a moment, a live page maybe. Um, so we started in the lab and, and got going and, and you start posting data and then people realize you're a bit more serious and, and, and you have to start publicizing a little bit um, before you do the project. Right? So, so rather than publishing the paper and then, and then talking about it, you, you describe it as it's going on you know, before it's done. Um, and, and these things all help. So you know, I, I tried to publicize it by doing a talk. Um, at Google and then Nature picked us up and and, um, and, and, a, and a popular blog called In the Pipeline picked us up and every time that happened you get a kind of spike of activity where people find out what you're doing and then come along uh, and you have to spend a lot of time trying to make it clear to people what's required in the project and you know, what the next steps are but as long as you do that people are interested in, in suggesting things um, which is very useful so the thing which was was amazing was when we hit a roadblock so we hit a, a very significant uh, scientific roadblock in this project 
um, which essentially was that we didn't have the right piece of equipment in the lab here at Sydney. Uh, and we didn't know um, what chemical to add into our, our chemical reaction to help us extract this, this mirror image form that we wanted. Um, so we had advice from a lot of company guys um, that we should be doing something called a resolution approach, which is something that's very old and well-established chemistry that Louis Pasteur would have used many years ago. Um, and we should be using that rather than the kind of highfalutin academic approaches that we were initially taking. Um, and so we, we, we changed the direction of the project to, to account for that. And then we hit this roadblock where we didn't have the right equipment and we didn't know what to add into this, this chemical reaction to make this mirror image uh, crash out as, as, as a nice sort of salt. And so I put out a request for help on various online fora, including um, LinkedIn, which is a, a um, yeah, the networking website, but it has groups there of many people with shared interests. And there's one uh, which uh, is about 1,000 people who specialize in uh, this area of chemistry, the process chemistry, which is large-scale chemistry and crystallizations and things like that. But a lot of very valuable advice back, including some offers of help. And, and from those offers of help, we selected one company that had offered to help us and sent them material in the mail, rather low-tech um, approach of collaborating. But we just mailed them a gram or so of this material. And they did some experiments and shared the data with us. And we posted that on the website. And they helped us get over this roadblock extremely quickly, because these guys were specialists at doing this. And they really showed in a very public arena how good they were at solving this problem. So with that lead, um, we then took that and optimized it, changed it a little bit in the lab for the rest of 2010. And then we ended up getting a process which was pretty good. Um, so the, the top line here it is the chemical version of what we did. Um, uh, the interesting thing about this was on the bottom, uh, a, a professional contract research organization were looking into the same problem um, at around the same time. And they came up with a solution on the bottom, starting with some intermediate molecule that we didn't know existed, but which you can buy on a large scale from, uh, from China. So these two solutions, even if you're not chemically minded, these two solutions obviously look quite similar. So the end result, of course, um, was that the open source approach found something that benchmarked pretty well against uh, something that was discovered by a professional outfit. Uh, I'm not sure about the time and the money involved in both of those processes, but these solutions end up being pretty similar. So um, uh, uh, one key result of this, of course, from, from our point of view as academics, but also as, as a way of, of, um, of publishing a milestone, is to make sure that all the stuff that you've done is actually then published. And so we, even though all, the, all of the data and all the lab books and everything were, and all the discussions were already available on the web, they weren't summarized anywhere as a formal paper. So we wrote all of this up and published it in PLOS, Neglect of Tropical Diseases, with a, a description of how the project worked in nature chemistry. And that was important a proof of point in the um, journals such as these and others will take papers that consist of, er of um, science that has already appeared in the public domain. That was an important feature for us. So, so releasing everything on the web uh, before publication does not in any way um, stop you publishing the work subsequently. It does in certain journals, uh, but it doesn't stop you um, publishing the paper outright. So the, there were a few things, just to quickly talk about some of the nice things about the way this project felt when we were doing it. One was that um, it was very nice to have all the work being very transparent. So it's not just the data that we share. Um, it's also the discussions of where the project's going and what we're going to do. And when we don't know how to do something, we talk about that. So the whole process is transparent. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I sense that the public are getting wise to the fact that they're funding a bunch of science, which is happening behind closed doors, and that they might, be, they might actually be quite interested in seeing what's going on. Um, you know, we don't really have the right to do it in secret <laughs> if we're being funded by the public. And so it felt very nice that, that, that I could tell anyone who was interested that they could go and look at all our experiments and, and, and see what it was that we were planning on doing. Um, there's obvious educational advantages, which we can't talk about, which we haven't got time to talk about. But I mean, if I was a kid, you know, watching one of these projects would be great to see to have the project changed every day and just sort of follow it. And, um, another issue is that uh, the project doesn't rely on me uh, either. It's non-PI dependent. So if something bad happened to me or to the team or to the grant funding, uh, it didn't wouldn't really matter as far as the project goes because any everything is there in the public domain. So anyone can just sort of pick it up and, and run with it. Uh, it also felt extremely fast. That was another feature of the project that uh, we were really helped by people um, and, and that accelerated the, the process of research, no question. We, the research was, was faster because it was open, because uh, people found us and came to the project. 
Um, uh, but we realize a, an obvious le another lesson which I think anyone in software would know, which is that you don't just sit back and expect people to help out. You have to be pretty active in driving the project, and every every project should be the same. You have to have someone who's driving it. Um, it doesn't have to be us. It was us because we were funded, but you need someone who's in the who's, who's sort of pushing things forward. Um, as we were doing this, you come up against a lot of problems with data. I mean, some some issues with how you share data and how you interact with with people, but also with the web. Um, and one of the nice things about it was that you know because you're completely open, you can work with anybody. Um, and we've uh, uh, the project has benefited a great deal from a lot of technical inputs by an undergraduate here at Sydney Uni called Mike Rogan, who's who sort of modified the electronic lab notebook and built extensions to it, uh, and has shared those um, on the web. Including ways that we can Google molecules, for example. So, um, you know, when when you load up Google, there's a little uh, search box there, and and you don't realize you don't it doesn't clock, but you can't draw things in that box, right? You have to put words in. So, if you want to search for a molecule, you can't just draw a molecule, unfortunately, which is the way we we work as chemists. Um, and so, Mike developed a way in which uh, the pictures that we post on the lab notebooks can be uh, recognized by a bit of software um, and converted into a text string called a smile string, which is very common. Way of, uh, of representing molecules with with letters, and then you can search on that. So he's developed a way in which our, our pictures of molecules can be inserted as text into our lab notebook entries, which means that Google would pick them up. Uh, very nice. I mean, it's a it's a beautiful uh, little extension to the lab notebook, which makes it much more usable. Um, and one of the nice things about working in the open is you can just work with people like this without worrying about confidentiality or or, or patenting and so on. We also experimented. Um, with writing papers in various ways, so we um, have written a review on a, on a, on a well, we, we have nearly finished writing a review on a certain area of chemistry uh, using a wiki where anybody can help us out again with, with writing this. So this is written on Open Wetware, uh, which is a, a wiki-based community for uh, biomedical uh, research, and we're using it for various things, including uh, writing papers. Um, and one of the nice things about a wiki, of course, is that you can you can write with anybody and allow anybody to come along and contribute. Um, and help, and particularly with a review, that's quite useful because a lot of work goes into a review, and uh, you know the more the merrier. Uh, so in this case, uh, Michael Tarselli here is some guy, is, is a guy uh, that we've never met, but um, we've been working on this review with, and he's been contributing. Um, and when we finally finish this thing off, you know, we will then he will obviously be an author because he's helped with the writing of the paper. Um, and a particularly nice thing about a wiki, of course, is that you have um, a record of all the revisions, and um, and you can monitor who's done what. Uh, and it's very easy to do quality control because you can see who's added a piece, and then you can see who's uh, you, you can keep track of of, um, of who is who has read what and who has checked what. Because of course, with every wiki page, there is a um, an about page, and you can write about about the nature of writing the paper as well as the paper itself. Uh, for data for other projects that we're using, I'll, I'll get into the drug discovery one just at the end uh, in, in a few in a couple of minutes. Um, but we're using other sites that already exist for the sharing of data, so we're not really building a lot of sites. For um, for data management, we're using a lot of things which are already out there, um, including uh, so GitHub is the thing we've just started playing with as a way of sharing things like Excel sheets and Word documents, um, which again keep revision histories, which is very useful. GitHub is meant for software, but is useful for files too. Um, we have also been using something called Campbell, which is an online database of a lot of biological activity data, and PubChem itself, which is a, a wonderful resource of freely available chemical information. So we don't have to build anything; we can use stuff that's already there. Uh, and interface with those sites, which is very powerful. Um, so we nearly have everything. We have uh, from the top there, we've got an electronic lab notebook where we share everything, and then to the left we've got this thing called the Synaptic Leap, which is a blog where we, should, where we describe what's going on. We've then got wikis on the bottom left where we can write together. We've got journals in the bottom right where we can publish the work, and then we've got other things like other blogs, um, which just which talk about what we're doing. So again, we get commentary on what we're doing uh, in in an informal setting. So it, it's a, it's a very Useful sort of circle of how to do science on the web in a very interactive way, um, and and it's nearly right, but we're missing something very crucial, which I'll get back to right at the end. So just in in the last few slides, I just want to mention the project that's going on now, um, which is drug discovery, uh, which is much more complicated because there's IP involved. Um, in the sense, we're discovering new molecules now, and of course, traditionally, if you ask anybody, they would expect you to say uh, that you need to have a patent to discover a drug. Um, this is this is not true, uh, but it's the the overwhelming um, opinion, you know, from anyone you speak to who is involved in, in discovering drugs that, that a patent will be necessary. We decided to uh, try and show that that wasn't the case, and so we're trying to do open source drug discovery, and that just means taking a, a compound which is in the public domain, 
testing it, evaluating it, and trying to optimize it as a compound that could be used to treat somebody for a disease. And because we had a, a wonderful support from the Medicines for Malaria venture in Geneva, we started um, a malaria project. Um, and the starting point is, is an extraordinary paper from 2010 from GlaxoSmithKline, uh, who put in the public domain thousands of chemical starting points um, which are active against malaria, really tremendous compounds which uh, kill the parasite inside red blood cells. Uh, and so we took some of those leads, some of the molecules are shown, and you start modifying them and evaluating them. Uh, we started out with a set of principles about how the project would work, um, and those are shown there. Some of these are crucial. I mean, all data and ideas must be shared. Anybody can take part, no patents. Uh, fourth law is about no flame wars, ideally, in online form. This is quite important. Um, trying to avoid email at all costs. And then the sixth law is very crucial, which is that the project exists as a thing and is not ours. It's something that we are contributing to and leading at the moment, but the idea is that it's meant to be beyond us, and anybody can contribute to the project. They don't have to join our team, they join the project. Um, so, the, I mean, the, this is a, a, a chemical slide, but the point is that you make variations in, in the structure, and we're doing that in the lab, and we have collaborating labs in the world who are doing that, and then you share, and then you, uh, you send those to biological collaborators who test them on malaria parasite, and we see if we can make improvements. We've already found very potent compounds this way in the last year or so. Um, which unfortunately were metabolized, so they're not perfect, but we are, the, the process is working in the sense that we're sharing data very effectively and people are offering advice and getting involved. That's the basic message. Um, again, it's not just the data, it's also the whole project. So we have consultation sessions which are streamed rather like we're streaming this session now. Uh, and then we record those and we put them on YouTube. So again, people can see where the project is going. It's not where it's been, it's where it's going. Um, and we're at the moment in the, in the middle of a consultation about which compounds to make, and we're trying to get those compounds made by, by multiple people. Um, I'll show you a, a, an update of that in a minute. We use informal things for dialogue in this project, so Google Plus has proven to be actually quite intuitive and useful as a way of having conversations about results and data and other things. Um, it's a good way of being found. It's very searchable, but it's also very intuitive. Um, the dialogue is very good because it's it's peer-to-peer, uh, -peer essentially. So uh, this is an example of a conversation which happened between an undergraduate who was working in my lab called Zoe, and uh, a professor who uh, in in uh, Melbourne who has been um, very supportive of the, of the project and who is an expert in medicinal chemistry. And this is an example of a conversation that was taking place on a point of science between the two of them without me getting involved. So again, one of the nice things about a blog like this is that it's uh, it's a level playing field, and people can interact with each other um, without uh, any hierarchy uh, getting in the way which is what science should be all about. So it's very nice when you, when you see things like this happening. Uh, but also other people can get involved. So at the top there is a very, is a very nice blog post, very long and involved blog post by, um, by a pharmaceutical expert called Chris Southern, uh, which came out the other day, which is very useful uh, and, and was full of useful information and suggestions. Um, and criticisms, which is also very important. Um, and below is, is, a, is a lab notebook that started up on our site by um, a chemist from Lucknow in India uh, who has been making molecules um, as part of the project. So um, it's a very easy way f to collaborate with someone overseas where you share all the raw data between everybody. So uh, one last point about the thing that's missing. So we, we nearly have everything, but actually we don't. We don't have everything that we need to do real quality open science because uh, we're the only ones doing this. Um, and unfortunately, the rest of the data universe in chemistry is not open. So what we really want, of course, uh, which would be transformative, is if everybody started doing this and sharing data, um, and if chemistry had its human genome moment where we decided to put all of the chemical reactions that had ever been run into the public domain, um, that doesn't happen at the moment because the databases of chemical information are expensive and proprietary. Um, and so we can't search data and we can't devise algorithms to effectively search chemical data at the moment, which would be great for us. Um, so our data can be searched, but of course we don't benefit from the searching of everyone else's lab notebooks because those lab notebooks are either secret or they are on paper, unfortunately. Um, so there, there are some people I want to uh, thank there, which, and, and they're up there. Lots of people, of course, with an open project because lots of people get involved. Um, uh, people who pay the bills are shown there, and uh, people who have done a lot of the work are shown there too. Um, I wanted to, uh, just in the last couple of minutes, just show you the live versions of a couple of things. And then I'll I'll stop talking. Um, just instead of having a slide there, I was going to show you um, a couple of things uh, which are live. So this is an example of one of the lab notebook pages. 
um, which is uh, so so it's it's a regular pace. There's the picture of a chemical uh, reaction. There's a table there of, of how we are working. There's a hazard assessment so that you can see that the the, the relevant safety precautions have been taken. And then there's a bunch of descriptions and some pictures and, some, and there will be some data. This reaction is from uh, the 26th of November, so it's a couple of days ago. So um, we're waiting for some data there, uh, and when when it's acquired, it'll be uploaded. It's very nice because it doesn't require any sign-in. You can comment on things. Um, you can search by date and other things. So it's very intuitive and useful, uh, and it's open source and it's free to use. Um, the blog that we've got running on Synaptic Leap again is quite attractive. You can you can post pictures here. So this is um, uh, an update that was done uh, yesterday. Uh, about where we are with getting the last few molecules that we need for this series in malaria. Um, and it's very easy to post comments at the end. So again, you can interact in this nice way of, uh, of, of reading and thinking about something and then posting your thoughts. Um, and then the last thing is uh, it's just to share the, um, the Google Plus site, which is very intuitive. And I just wanted to show you this because we need three more molecules for, for the completion of our current set. Um, and uh, one of the postdocs, Alice Williamson, who's working on the project, just posted this this morning, which I think is fantastic, which has got the three molecules that we need mocked up in a wanted poster. Um, and it's already getting people forwarding it because it's a really good idea. Um, it says wanted active or inactive, preferably active there, uh, which, is, which is a really great thing to do. So this is a way in which you can go from the lab notebook, which is formal data, to something which is much less formal and more kind of usable for, for people to bring attention to the fact that we, that we need things for the, for the project. So it's a range of things, and we will use whatever sites are intuitive for people uh, and, and popular and which, and which do the job. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Matthew. That's absolutely fascinating kind of overview. <clears throat> I hope you're not going to ask us any questions on those little uh, those smile diagrams. Is that right? The little... <laughs> no, <Okay>. that's fine. <laughs> yeah, because I, I did study for a long time the difference between the, the, uh, the two symmetrical you know, opposites and I'm oh, great. not sure I could answer your question, yeah, answer that even the difference between the two, but anyway. <laughs> um, the, uh, a question that occurred to me was the, you brought up the link between data and collaboration and you sort of said that open data was uh, necessary for collaboration, but you know, not sufficient you needed there were other things that were required for collaboration and you, know, you went through a lot of the social and technical tools there for the collaboration I just want to um, ask you about the, the the well the link between the the, the data and collaboration um, in the sense of the openness of data and how much that leads to more collaboration in a sense so that if I have a a data set and I'm, I'm making it uh, available is there um, is that likely to lead to you know uh, more collaborative opportunities and I suppose as a, a follow-up yeah. to that I'm assuming that collaboration is good and you know what is the link between collaboration and success in the sense of getting the right outcomes or getting the right publications etc right, so right. The, the link between the data and collaboration and then the link between collaboration and you know, the, the final goals that you're trying to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, I mean, I, I take the, the long view here uh, that in, you know, in 500 years time, we, we are not going to be doing science like we're doing it at the moment. Um, the world is going to be a very different place and, and the activities of everyone on the planet are going to be linked in a way that we can't conceive of right now. And it's going to be very easy to find anyone uh, in the world uh, who is working on what you're currently working on and to collaborate seamlessly with, with the best and most active people. I mean, it's, it's going to be a, um, it would be absurd to, um, I, th I think in the future it's going to be absurd to keep research secrets, <laughs> basically. So I think the, the, the answer to your question is that I think if you, if you, if you share data, you may stimulate activity. Um, the Human Genome Project stimulates an activity. But if you share, if you share your activity itself, you share what it is you're doing, um, I think that tends to stimulate activity more because you it's a human instinct to get involved with something that is interesting and which is going on right now. I mean, if I walk along the street and I see someone building something, um, I'm more likely to think, oh, what's going on there and what can I do, versus if I come to something which either is abandoned or which is being built. 
uh, you know, I mean, it's the same with, with you know, if you if you uh, if you play with Lego, right? And someone sees you playing with Lego, so people tend to sort of join in. I'm talking about my, my son. Um, so I, I think I think it, it tends to it tends to bring out um, uh, the best in people if people can think, well, I can actually get involved here. And so I think that's that's a very different thing from sharing data. If you share data, it's never quite clear if the project is active, if it's still going on, if there's something that you can do, uh, which can make a difference. Um, whereas if something is being shared every day, so if there's a dribble feed of activity every day, um, I think you will, I don't know, I, th I think people will be more interested to see, well, what's going on there? Uh, it's going on right now, so if I suggest something now, and if I do something now, I will actually make a difference. Um, so I think it's a human nature thing, um, which, is, which, is, which is very important. I think it's a very important point. What about um, the acknowledgement? Uh, is it necessarily diluted by openness? You know, your your link with the success. Um, yeah. Is well, it, because the team is bigger. Sure. Um, I think so. Yes. I mean, um, if we at, at the moment we're, we're we're I guess we have the luxury that we're we're the only project doing this kind of thing with open source drop discovery, and we're the only ones trying, you know, putting out small molecules every day in the public domain. Um, so we, we have the luxury that if we find a drug, if that actually happens, um, then that's going to change everything. And so that would be very high impact. Of course, if everybody did it, uh, which is what's going to happen, but if everyone does it, um, then, then the impact will be, of course, less because it's not going to be the first time it's happened. Um, it's still significant because you're helping people. Um, but it's not going to have the same sort of academic significance. Um, so I think the, the the component then would reduce. But then you think, well, why do people contribute to open source software in such huge numbers? Why is it that there are millions of people, literally, who are you know on SourceForge, posting things and doing things? Um, I think there's a natural human instinct just to help solve problems, um, and you can do that in a public domain and demonstrate how good you are at doing something in a public domain with an open project. So there's an incentive because it's kind of on a live stage. Hmm. And some of what you're talking about is a, is a social hierarchy as well. It's, you, know, you were talking about you know, science without hierarchies and science with um, people from all over the globe and yeah. science with people from you know, developing countries, etc., who may not have had the opportunity before. And a lot of these are, are a different, it's a change in social attitude as well. Yes, exactly. So it's meritocratic, right? That's it's genuinely meritocratic, because you just need a web page and a connection, um, and you don't have to be called professor. So you you can just chip in based on your expertise, and if you make a genuinely useful point, that will be acknowledged. Um, I mean, it's it's how it should be. It should be essentially blind, you know, that we don't really care who we are. We just listen to the contribution. I, I think that's one of the real strengths of this, um, uh, and one of the things that's most refreshing about it, you know, is that. Is that um, the contributions don't have to come uh, up a chain of command; they can be given directly. The, the educational point about that, uh, that, that's also extremely important, is that yes, the students in different countries can uh, can uh, educate each other um, both ways uh, in a scalable way that doesn't rely on everything going through a small number of academics. So, with the um, access to information. Um, uh, do you have a friction sort of not knowing whether you can use information that seems to be in the public domain or you know, that where you're not 100% sure about the terms and conditions of being able to use something or hidden IP or things like that? How is yeah. it working with um, the All of the data that we generate is, um, uh, I mean, the, the, the project, unless otherwise stated, is governed by CC BY 3. So you can use anything in the project that you want, as long as with attribution. Um, the uh, the data are open for 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 free uh, reuse. Um, if we so that's all of our stuff. If you um, if we use something else from someone else, um, then we obviously can't you know take papers from journals that are subscription only and then post those on web pages. You know we can't do that. Um, we so we have to be a little bit careful of that. We if we get contributions by so the, so the only the only stumbling block usually are contributions that I get by email, uh, questions or comments that I get by email um, 
that I then always have to go back and check with the original person um, if I can use the comment and put it in the public place. And I have to then manually go back and check that. It's one of the reasons why, why I, I try and dissuade people at all times to from, from using email because of that. Um, so I, I want people to be able to contribute in the public domain completely. Um, and it's pretty rare that there's a reason why the public domain is no good, why email suddenly is required. So we don't, I mean, on a day-to-day on -day basis, we have no issues, no. It's only with the occasional email. Or if we need to share a paper in some way, we have to be creative in the way that we describe it without infringing any of the, uh, the copyright. There's a question from Catherine. We might try and uh, transfer Catherine to the mic here. Uh, Catherine, can you uh, hear me? Uh, how about I read Catherine's question? Have you seen a spin-off effect with folk outside your research team, but within the same science community? Uh, for example, other research teams now taking a similar approach? Um, not yet, no. Um, we haven't. I mean, there, there are massive uh, uh, barriers in place to mostly incentives and, and metric measures that, that would dissuade people from doing this. Um, the, the metrics of science, academic and industrial science, at the moment um, encourage competition and secrecy. I mean, that's just the way we're measured. So we need to publish in certain journals, and those journals often don't accept work that's public domain. Um, and there is a competitive advantage at the moment in publishing something at the expense of other people. Um, so th there is there is not too much incentive to share. I think those are changing gradually, and I think there'll be there are significant changes coming from the top down, which I think are going to make a big difference in terms of uh, the requirements that we're seeing now being mandated for open access publishing, but also the sharing of data. I think those are going to make a big a big difference to, to the way people work. But at the moment, not really. Um, no, there is a there is an open source drug discovery consortium in India, um, which has been very active in the uh, annotation of a TB genome, um, uh, and, and uh, but which has not so far put a lot of um, information about drugs in the public domain. So as far as I can tell, we're the doing this small molecule drug discovery in the public domain. I think Jerry um, had a similar so, kind of question. Todd, uh, she was asking about uh, is there resistance from institutions about their researchers being involved. So what does the University of Sydney think about you being involved, for example? Well, let's not make it personal, but yeah, and that's the kind um, of question. Sure, yeah. The, uh, the University of Sydney uh, was, uh, was very good about foregoing IP on the two projects that I was talking about, of course, because they wanted the projects to happen. Um, so, so built into the contracts there is, is, a, is an unusual IP clause, you know, which says that basically there isn't any. Um, because it's going to be open. It's going to be open source. So uh, th there's no delay between the experiment being done, really, and the data being released. So there's no way you can patent anything uh, on that, even if you wanted to. Um, so they've been very good about that. Uh, now, if that, I, I, I don't know if that can be broadened out, of course, um, beyond just our project. Uh, that's a very interesting discussion, though, about whether universities are are uh, are, do, are are monitoring IP correctly. Or whether they're being too aggressive in in monitoring all of their IP, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm not an expert on that. Um, I I would advocate endlessly that if you really want to innovate, you need to stop thinking and worrying about intellectual property uh, too much, because I think that if you really want to do things quickly, you need to work more quickly and have more eyeballs on the problem. So what you lose in IP control, you gain in speed and innovation. Um, but that's a pretty big discussion that we can have um, over a beer. Yeah, a very large beer. I should do that one in Germany. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, uh, might uh, just take the opportunity to cut over to Baden and um, just check what there's. Well, unless Baden had any other questions on this particular topic, whether you've there's an update from the the world of Osgold, Baden. Thanks, Adrian. Um, I'd just like to say thanks, Matthew. That was a terrific uh, presentation. I do confess to the world at large I had seen it before in Helsinki or something similar to it, certainly not as up-to-date as it was now. And uh, one of the reasons why I was so uh, happy that Matthew was able to attend today would be to share that all with you. I, well, then I, I expect um, you should know what those um, diagrams mean now. All the things I've seen it twice. <laughs> <laughs> you just beat me to it. I was just about to say, but still, I can't get over the chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll have but, to see it three times then, Baden. Uh, 
I, I think I think uh, I need to have a really big beer with Matthew to get him to teach me some basic chemistry. I don't think that's going to help. Test. Don't worry, no test. <laughs> But um, in any event, I, I looked at also, I just thought it was interesting to note some of the principles there that you were talking about in that, that slide, uh, Matthew, and I thought one of the, 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 the first law uh, was open and um, from where I come from, um, that translates into making sure uh, we've got all our house in order and as you've pointed out, uh, copyright and nested copyrights can be a pain in the neck, but if you think about them first, they don't necessarily have to be as painful as they perhaps otherwise could be. But uh, aside from that, um, what's happening in Osgol world, uh, probably not a great deal uh, uh, to discuss on an academic side, a lot of stuff is happening in government, but uh, on the academic side of things, uh, not a not a great deal. Um, I did uh, note, however, the release yesterday of the the NRIP, the National Research Investment Plan, um, and in fact, uh, I counted. No less than 19 references to open access in that uh, uh, plan that was released yesterday, the day before, from the minister. So I have high hopes, as uh, Matthew said, that uh, uh, things are changing from the top down, and it would be very good uh, if we were prepared with licensing as these things did commence to change from the top down. Um, the only other thing I would point out is, um, oh sorry, on the CC uh, uh, side of things, version 4 is about to be released uh, mid-December, version 4 licenses of the Creative Commons. That's the uh, final, uh, I suppose, version of the drafts that have been circulated uh, across the year. Uh, the process thereafter is a little bit um, uh, perhaps not well defined in terms of timeframes as to when the new version 4 licenses will be comported or ported as it's referred to as uh, across to the Australian versions but uh, I have every expectation that it won't be too long so, uh, after that. Um, and the other thing was there is a, uh, a good conference coming up in New Zealand, in Auckland in February, the New Zealand-Australia Open Research, uh, I think that's what it's called, Matt, isn't it? New Zealand? That's right. Open Research Conference. Uh, Matt is um, right. is part of the organising committee, I think, and yes, right. uh, I'm pretty sure I'm also there as well. Um, so if you've got further interest in open access and research and how open access is deployed in research uh, uh, research field. Uh, there it is up on the screen. Um, it's from the, thank you for refreshing my memory Matt, <laughs> it's the 6th to the 7th of February 2013 uh, in Auckland. So I look forward to seeing some people there if they happen to be listening to this online or part of the participant group currently uh, with us. Excellent. Other than that, Adrian, I haven't really got much to add. I think there was a question, sorry, there was a question on notice uh, from Catherine um, Unsworth. Do the participants get to see those questions or how would you like me to attend to that? Uh, no, the participants don't see those questions and I can't see the one you're talking about, so why don't you address it? Okay. Um, well, uh, Catherine asked if uh, I'll just briefly go to uh, my email. Um, so I'll try to be as brief with the question as I possibly can. Uh, the query related to the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Derivative Licence which as you may recall allows you to freely copy and distribute and display and, and or perform the material. Um, 
and you can make commercial reuse of the material uh, on the proviso that, that you attribute uh, as you would normally with all the other CC licenses and also um, in particular uh, do not make a derivative of the material i.e. you do not alter, transform, uh, another word might be adapt uh, the work, uh, you may not build upon it with the exception under the license that it may be incorporated into a collection. So for example if a paper was written um, uh, and somebody wanted to make that uh, chapter in a book, you could include the paper in the book provided that it wasn't interfered with in any way, shape or form, modified or, or otherwise. Um, and Catherine wrote uh, to us saying that um, the scenario is this, that a data visualization tool is being developed that pulls in uh, at this point uh, data collections from four different data sources, each of which have aggregated data deposited by members of a number of scientific communities. Two of the input data sources have licensed their data under the Creative Commons non-derivative license. The visualization tool does not in any way modify the data, but instead it combines all four data sources into what might be considered a summary or compilation to display an overview of the current evidence supporting the identification of various gene products across chromosomes such as protein expression, modification and disease association with the ability to drill down to the original data. And uh, she writes, does this constitute building upon the work? Uh, would you need to request more explicitly permissions to use the data in this way? Or does the definition around the term derivative in the legal code and the exception for collections allow us to continue using this data in this way even under the Creative Commons non-derivative license. And she goes and uh, very helpfully outlines the definition of what derivative work is, which I won't go into. Um, and she says, uh, I hope this makes sense. <laughs> um, famous last words as they say. Uh, look, it, it does make sense and uh, effectively what, what we're having here is, a, is uh, four data sources being incorporated into one repository and um, with some things that can be done to that data. Um, I confess I rang Catherine because uh, she left an open invitation to contact her and uh, not that it didn't make sense, I think she expressed it very well, um, but I needed some further information. As a general rule, I don't think the non-derivative license is an appropriate license for data. You simply can't do much with it and the test for this is uh, is this uh, visualization tool effectively creating a collection? If it is, then that is a complete defense uh, against infringement of the non-derivative license. If it's not, uh, then it, it may well infringe. I think uh, it's sailing close to the wind. Uh, my preference would be for Catherine to go to the people supplying the material under the non-derivative license and invite them to make an alternative licensing decision, uh, which they can do and in fact this happens all the time. Um, uh, and one of the features and strengths of Creative Commons is that the licenses are non-exclusive and the licensor can reconsider their position at any time, as often they do with the non-commercial licenses, for example, where material is made available under a non-commercial license uh, but then a commercial reuser comes along and says I think that's something I could really do with and uh, they contact the licensor and say can we negotiate an appropriate arrangement for commercial reuse. Uh, so in a nutshell uh, that's where I think that one's uh, at. I think uh, I unfortunately don't uh, know enough about the tool, uh, the data visualization tool. I, I very much like to have a look at it one day. Um, 
and perhaps I can make a more refined response based upon that observation. But um, uh, until then, I would much prefer if Catherine and others in this uh, predicament a um, uh, renegotiate um, the material or indeed encourage people in the research space not to um, apply the non-derivative license. It's very, very restrictive. And in fact, that's one of the comments that's been made about Osgol. Uh, they say our acronym says Open Access and Licensing Framework, but most of our licenses are highly restrictive. Um, and that's, that's true, uh, but we prefer, we certainly prefer the least restrictive ones. And over time, we, uh, we do and we are actively uh, uh, reconsidering um, uh, the licenses that we have. And in fact, uh, I'm looking at a couple of other licenses right now. That's good, uh, I think um, that was, Baden. Yeah, yeah, no, just, just, uh, I think that's a uh, good advice, with, you know, given the, it's like, you know, being a doctor and asked, uh, being asked to diagnose, you know, over the phone. Uh, you can give, you know, I suppose, general guidance. Uh, I should remind everyone that um, Baden, you know, there's a partnership between uh, Osgol and ANS, uh, whereby um, research organisations, specifically if you're looking at selection policy, you know, or you know these kind of tricky questions about uh, being able to, uh, what kind of uh, materials can be used in in a research integration kind of scenarios. Um, Baden works with ANS on these kind of things. We've got a couple of ANS staff. We work on these kind of questions, and uh, if any of the uh, people in the Australian research community um, would like to, um, you know, look more carefully at, at the way they're doing things and want some advice and guidance, um, then uh, feel free to contact us, and uh, we're happy to work with you on some more sort of targeted uh, questions. That's both at the research group area and uh, level, and also at the organisational level, like at the policies and selection policies and things like that. That I'm certainly I happy think, to travel to you. Yeah, that's good. Yes, and, and Baden is the uh, sort of licensed pollinating bee that uh, goes around from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, seeing as though he's the national program director. So he's probably at a um, capital city near you. Uh, sometime soon. So uh, be very keen to work in partnership with some of the you know, research organisations um, to help them make some significant steps. Uh, all right, so there's uh, now, um, Baden, if, uh, how would people uh, follow you or get in contact in that sense? What's the best way? Uh, sure. Well, the Osgol website, www.osgol.gov.au, if you hit the Contact Us link, you've got links to my number, my email, my LinkedIn. Uh, more than happy to hear from anyone at any time. As well as that, you can follow us on Twitter. Uh, and we also have a LinkedIn group, as Matthew uh, said. LinkedIn groups are really good spaces to get people who are working on similar issues uh, together and sharing information. So we've got that. We've also got Google Plus pages and, and other things like that up and running. Uh, they take a long time uh, sometimes, all these different channels to keep maintained, but uh, I guess Twitter is my tool of choice at the moment. Sure. Um, but uh, but yeah, free, feel free to give me a call on, on the phone or uh, via email and I can give you a call. All those channels, it's certainly open access in, in uh, practice. Um, and you know, good luck if you can keep up with Baden's Twitter feed. Is is the second advice there? If you'll get a lot of very interesting things um, coming through there. Uh, from the ANS point of view, we the ANS website has uh, a lot of material about the licensing, and you can always uh, contact ANS uh, through that website. Um, and again, very keen to work in partnership with um, research groups and research organisations. Um, Matthew, if people are interested in working with you or following your kind of uh, thoughts, where, how would they do that? Um, well, I think uh, that there is I, there's, a, there's a Twitter account for the Malaria Project. Um, probably Google Plus is a good way of doing this. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm on there just as my name, and there is an OSDD Malaria 
uh, account as well. Um, that would probably be the easiest way of getting in touch um, and following what we're doing. Um, uh, also, it's very easy to sign up as a, as a member of the Synaptic Leap community where a lot of the updates are posted. Um, so any of those those kind of places would um, would be fine. Uh, if if there's still if you're still not clear about what to do, then um, email is is always <laughs> it's always a possibility, and then I can I can forward some ways of, of doing that. Yeah, you'll you'll forward that email onto your blog. Is that right? No. <laughs> <laughs> not, uh, not automatically. No. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. Well, thank you very much. It's a really absolutely fascinating presentation today, and some really good uh, discussion uh, on the panel. Thank you, Baden. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew, for uh, making time. It's always good for Sorry. us to see how the Pleasure. information principles that we work with, you know, access to information and access to data and collaboration around information how they actually bedded down in uh, real research. So thank you very much for that. And thank you, uh, thank you all for uh, participating. Thanks for the people with uh, insightful questions. We will uh, have another series in our, uh, another item in our licensing webinar series uh, early next year. So just watch the ANS website. And um, there's a number of uh, other uh, interesting uh, series you know for example our research data management series of webinars if you're interested again just to have a look at the ANS website and um, check out the uh, upcoming um, sessions thanks all, all for that and uh, we'll see you soon and Biden and I yes and um, thanks for technical production from Alex Hayes all right we'll see you soon Ta -da. Okay, Biden.